Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. Good morning, Dr. Paul. How are you? I'm doing well. And today is a serious day because I understand that you have received some questions to be asked to me by you. And the big question is, will I have some really interesting answers? <laughs> yeah, they're not even by me. They're by your fans. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's Ask Ron Paul again. We like to do these every few weeks because it's enjoyable. This time we got a really great group of questions. I had probably 20, but we would have gone all day. But we're going to cut right to the chase. Let's hit the first question um, for Ask Ron Paul. Uh, what would be the most logical way to progress from our current income tax model to the fair tax model? Well, the easiest way is repeal the 16th Amendment. Get rid of this whole concept, this whole philosophy of an income tax. Uh, there is no such thing as a fair tax uh, when it comes to income tax. It's one of the most vicious because it is based on the assumption that the government owns all our income and that we can keep a certain amount under certain conditions that the government dictates. So they have the deductions and all this, and it invites a monster. The accountants love it, uh, and the special interests like it and all. But no, they're, 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 income tax is never fair. Almost all taxes are unfair uh, because they're so unnecessary, and they're designed by people who promote big government. And the Constitution um, should be obeyed. If we did that, then we wouldn't have an income tax. Uh, they've talked about this a long time. The founders said no income tax. Lincoln said have one during the Civil War, then we got rid of it. And then when they came up with it in 1913, they said, oh, this is just a little one, just a little bit of income tax, <laughs> and it just would put it on the rich, you know, and take care of it. So it's the deception that goes on. But, uh, but basically, this is a reflection on why the income tax is such a menace. It's because government is so big. You see, all that the income tax does, it enhances the ability of big government people to uh, raise taxes and finance their system. And just look back, uh, you know, from 1913 on, government has grown uh, exponentially, along with uh, the other tax cause, uh, called the inflation tax yeah. in the Federal Reserve was designed at that same time. So the progressive era of the, of the teens, and 1913 in particular, ushered in an age which uh, has not been very good for the American people, not very good for liberty. Yeah. Well, we have a two-part question for number two, and it's because they're related. So we'll roll one and read it, and then we'll roll the second one okay. and, and get the, uh, your insights. These are both on war. First question, is there ever a valid reason to go to war or use military action from the libertarian perspective? Explain the reasons. And then the second part, which is related to it, the second question is, uh, is there such thing as a just war? For example, should the U.S. have intervened during the genocide in Rwanda? Some tough questions. Yeah, um, on, a, on a just war and whether libertarians should justify war, you know, if, if you're a pacifist but you also want to be a libertarian, I don't think you'd get kicked out. Mm -hmm. You know, pacifism is is a lot better form of foreign policy than uh, the neocons' foreign policy, perpetual war for perpetual peace. So that would um, uh, that would be okay. I don't think um, the Libertarian Party. I I don't take the position uh, that uh, there is not a a war that uh, uh, that you shouldn't enter into. But it has to be defensive. Uh, I cannot see, you know, and I look at it first in a personal sense. If somebody invades my house, I'm a non-gun person in many ways. I don't like guns and killing and this sort of thing, and I, I despise all this war. But I would be capable of defending myself and my family if somebody marched into my house and threatened our lives. Yes, and that would be a retaliation in a way that would be my little war. But a country, I think, has a right, a right to do this. But uh, what countries ought to do is wise up and avoid the confrontation. Now, is there a just war when there's such atrocities going in in the various countries? And uh, uh, they're, they're, this is a little tougher because there's a lot of sympathy. But the libertarian principle is still very firm. 
you know, if uh, if you have cousins living in com country A and they're under siege and you support their position, there should never be a government prohibition against you sending money or sending a weapon or going over there and fighting. But governments don't have a right, no matter how justified it seems that you endorse one faction over another, that you have the authority to draft young people or use young people or draft our money, inflate the currency to go over there to per per perpetuate justice. So I don't think it's uh, morally correct to do it, but uh, practically it's not good either. It never, never works. And in a practical sense, uh, the moral injustice of communism, think of the millions, hundreds of millions of people died, you know, in China and Russia and, and under fascism in Germany. Yes, it, it, was, uh, it was horrible, uh, but we didn't invade Russia. They became our allies, you know, in, in fighting. So I don't, uh, I, I, this, uh, when people are starving, you say, well, at least send them food. But what happens, we, we've seen this happen, and we've watched it while up in Washington, is, the, is uh, these, uh, this foreign aid and assistance to one faction becomes a war weapon mm -hmm. because the strongest person gets the food and they get the weapons even if you send it to help somebody. This is sort of the justification of some of the recent wars like uh, in Libya, you know, and and uh, Iraq and Syria. Oh, we got to get get rid of Assad because he's killing his own people. He's gassing his own people. And it invites lies. So the principle has to be that you don't have the right to do that interfere if uh, they're not attacking you or threatening you in any way. And uh, we would have been a lot less war and a lot less people died over the last, especially the last 25 or 30 years because so many people have died, not only our soldiers, but so many of the uh, people who became victims of our policy. Yeah. Well, moving on to number three, and this is about uh, libertarianism and libertarian ideas. We have the third question coming up. It's out there somewhere. Here we are. How do we get ideas like yours and Rand's, such as end the Fed, audit the IRS, to really become mainstream talking points? Good question. Well, I find it as a good question because this boils down to the issue that I'm always talking about people's attitudes have to change before Washington changes. When I was in Washington, even though I was in politics, the politics, uh, I wasn't very happy messing with that because that's just a power struggle. And, uh, and you know, uh, how do you get the best uh, position on, and, and how do you become a chairman <laughs> and, and the p political things that go on. Uh, so um, I would say that, uh, in, if you're in politics or supporting somebody, support somebody who believes in this, and uh, the people will hear about it. So I was shocked during the presidential campaigns that I thought I was talking to this many people, just a few. Mm -hmm. But when I went out to the campuses, even liberal campuses, there was a large segment of young people then that was very much aware of the Federal Reserve and, uh, and, and, and you know, the, the whole idea of sound money. So I was very impressed. But we did a lot of work, uh, you know, in Congress trying to make it a point. But we also had our organization called Campaign for Liberty. That was their big issue. Audit the Fed, audit the Fed. Mm -hmm. So they were grassroots working on changing people's minds, putting pressure on the congressman. And that's why several times that uh, even since I left, they've had votes in the House. And the votes are won. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't... Uh, when I was there and we won it, it wasn't because, oh, Ron, I know you're on the right track and this is what we really want. <laughs> it wasn't that. They were getting a lot of messages from home. So if you want these things to go mainstream, you have to have a philosophic base for it. And that has been building. The Libertarians' idea and the Austrian School of Economics and Lou Rockwell with uh, the Mises Institute, this has changed the minds. And so I was so pleasantly surprised that the first time I heard the chanting and the Fed and the yeah. Fed was on a liberal college yeah. campus and so that they were influenced by ideas so they're out there so when you want the uh, have a better presence in Washington uh, you have to change people's mind to influence uh, people but uh, there's a lot of different ways people would do it talk show hosts and people who write letters investment counselors and a lot of people know and understand uh, you know the whole issue but everybody has to be involved and it's it's amazing to me I mean people 
all, I know they have unique ways of presenting this. And to me, the best thing to do is argue it on a moral basis. You know, it's just totally dishonest to counterfeit money and create an economic system like we have now that benefits the rich and, uh, and, and damages the poor and destroys the middle class. Exactly. Well, we often try to end on a slightly lighter note, so we do have another one question this time that's a slightly lighter note. Uh, the final question of the day. I was wondering if you were still a Houston Astros fan. Pretty good team this past season. There's even a picture, I think, if you want to scroll up. Yeah. Who's that? Yeah, Who's I, don't, that? I don't know who that is in that Astro shirt. Somebody told me that's the ugliest uniform ever. They didn't tell me I was the ugliest baseball player ever. And some people have been misled, and I want to correct the record. I never played for the Astros, <laughs> but I did play a little bit of baseball. I was a frustrated baseball player. I never had a team um, as a kid where we had uniforms, a real team. We did a lot of baseball, but it was real sandlot baseball, and we didn't have a high school team. And uh, I did well in track, so track conflicted. So in college, I did track rather than baseball, but I loved uh, baseball. So when I got to Congress and heard there was a baseball team, I thought, well, I'll try this <laughs> out, you know, <laughs> and do it. And I had a lot of fun. And one thing that I thought was neat about it was that Republicans and Democrats, the people you were, played with, uh, became pretty close friends, you know, we always remain friendly. And even now, if I would bump into a Democrat that we played baseball, we wouldn't remember any uh, differences on, uh, on uh, issues, mm -hmm. but we would remember that we played baseball together, which I really liked. And I thought, well, you know what? And when I was giving my last speech on the House floor when I was leaving in 1984, um, I said, you know, one thing I suggest you do is play more baseball. <laughs> baseball is good. More baseball, less of this legislating. All you're doing is harming the people passing this legislation. People should play more baseball. And in a way, you know, uh, uh, playing ping pong with the Chinese yeah. uh, uh, didn't, uh, didn't uh, uh, hurt us. And the one, you know, a lot of times if you're in a debate or having a question and you regret, I should have said this, I should have <laughs> said I've had that come up a couple times, um, uh, you know, in the campaign. But the one question, if I had a chance to answer again, <laughs> I don't think I've ever told anybody these deep feelings I have. <laughs> but it, it came up when somebody said, all right, uh, you're the president. And they come and they say, Castro's on the phone. What are you going to say to him? I, I, I said, I'd ask him why he called. <laughs> you know, everybody laughed. They thought it was funny. But I should have said, I challenge you to a baseball game, and you and I will be the p p pitchers or the hitters <laughs> or something. You and America, you know, United States, and Castro. The big tr problem with that is the Cubans probably would have pretty good. Yeah, they're good. So, uh, no, base baseball was a lot of fun, and uh, I think uh, the, uh, the politicians ought to play more baseball and less of this fighting over things that they shouldn't even be talking about, you know, <laughs> and how to take away our freedoms and destroy the money and start a war. <laughs> well, once again, you fielded all the questions, and uh, I think we had a fun time doing it. And I want to thank the audience for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Uh, please come back soon.